Welcome to What the Fuck Just Happened. I'm your host, Liz Enton. If you listen to the intro, you know my story. If not, here's a brief summary. I'm a science skeptic, and when my dad died, I took a shot in the dark and decided to investigate if there was any possible evidence of an afterlife. I assumed that was as realistic as Santa Claus, but I was desperate. However, I was so blown away by what I discovered that I wrote a book and launched this podcast. In this podcast, I will be talking to some fairly normal people about some really weird shit. I speak with everyone from psychic mediums and afterlife researchers to ordinary people who've had some inexplicable experiences. So come, listen, there's no need to draw any final conclusions. Keep an open mind and wonder, what the fuck just happened? In this episode, I speak with Dr. Melvin Morse. Heads up, this is the first episode where, or really the only episode where we also did a full video. I'd love your feedback if you like that better. So Dr. Melvin L. Morse is a medical doctor. He specializes in pediatrics and has researched NDEs, near-death experiences, in children. He has authored several books and articles on paranormal science and near-death experiences in children. As a medical student, Dr. Morse always pursued his interests in consciousness research. During a neurology rotation at Johns Hopkins, he worked under the legendary Vernon Montcastle and cared for patients who had half their brains removed or split brain surgery. He assessed the effects such surgery had on consciousness, his first understanding that consciousness does not depend on brain function. And for those of you who don't know what an NDE, near-death experience, is, that is when someone is clinically dead. Their heart stops beating, they have no brain activity, and then they're medically resuscitated. And they report experiences during this time, some which are verified, such as floating out of their body and describe what went on in the operating room. Sometimes they will report conversations their family members were having at home. Sometimes they report seeing deceased loved ones going through a tunnel. It's a really fascinating phenomenon. And now for my conversation with Dr. Melvin Morse. Hi, everyone. I am talking today to Dr. Melvin Morse, and he is a doctor who has some fascinating stories. So he can introduce himself, and you're in for a treat because he's going to share some really interesting near-death experience evidential and just remarkable stories. So welcome, Dr. Morse. Well, the universe is very funny, and the hallmark of spirituality is... Uh, is you know what I've learned after uh, oh, 40 plus years of studying it is that it's the odd, it's the humorous, it's the, uh, <laughs> the, the sort of thing that makes you sort of chuckle inside that is often associated with spirituality. And, you know, we often think the spirituality is so serious or so, uh, but uh, it's not. Um, I have a good friend, his name is Pierre Jovanovich, and he wrote, I think, the uh, premier book on uh, angels. And uh, he's an investigative journalist, and his book is called An Investigation of Angels. And he concluded that angels are real, powerful, and funny. And you're going to hear from these children's near-death experiences uh, that uh, many times they are very funny. Okay, so who am I and why did you invite me to your show? I'll, uh, I'm going to just summarize it for you. Um, I'm a pediatrician, now retired, and I, I studied near-death experiences and consciousness, uh, particularly in children, 
for the past 40 years. And this all started uh, when I was a resident in training at Seattle Children's Hospital. And we were called uh, to pick up a young girl uh, who had uh, drowned in a community swimming pool and she was underwater for 20 minutes. So, you know, that's near death by uh, any criteria. When uh, she got out of the water, her pupils were, were fixed and dilated, uh, which uh, to us means she has very little chance of survival. Uh, and yes, she did survive. And uh, after she survived, uh, I happened to be there when uh, she was resuscitated. And she looked at me and she said, oh, I remember you. You're the man that put a tube in my nose. And she went on to describe her entire resuscitation, including little comments that we made, including uh, just chance conversations between the nurses. You know, so clearly this wasn't something that she uh, made up or, uh, you know, invented or picked up from TV. And she was not conscious. She wasn't conscious. There was no way she could hear or see or use any of her normal senses. We, we uh, have a scoring scale for coma, and she was in the most profound coma that you can imagine. Her coma was so deep that uh, she didn't even have a gag reflex. Uh, her pupils, uh, you know, in her eyes, she didn't have a blink reflex. Uh, so she is not in any way uh, conscious. So that, that, that's why I'm here on your show. Because unless you're, I think, a physician who has been at the bedside of these critically ill children, and you have seen and know that they have personally survived dear death, I think it's very hard to believe this sort of thing. And so my, I, I completely uh, agree with uh, those who are skeptical and uh, it doesn't from, you know, from a scientific viewpoint, at least of uh, 20, 30 years ago, this didn't make any sense. You know, how can a comatose brain see something since we think of uh, uh, consciousness as being created by the brain? And so that was the position that I was in as a young uh, resident. Uh, I was a, a young uh, nerve uh, scientist in the training. I had been accepted uh, into a prestigious uh, neuroscience uh, program at the University of California, San Francisco. And uh, to my great surprise, I found that a patient who shouldn't have been remembering anything, um, who should have just been, can have completely blank memory, uh, instead could describe her entire cardiac arrest, then told me that she went up a tunnel uh, to a place she thought was heaven and uh, met playmates there, was told uh, by someone she thought was Jesus uh, that it wasn't her time to die. And when she saw the obvious uh, disbelief on my face, <laughs> she reaches over and she pats me on the wrist and she said, you'll see, Dr. Morse, heaven is fun. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not the last time I heard that. I just have one quick question because she used word Jesus, heaven. Was she raised religiously? That was the first question that we had, uh, we being our research team. She's a deeply devout Mormon and uh, came from a profoundly uh, religious uh, Mormon family. Yet her visit to heaven had nothing to do with her Mormon faith. She told me that, you know, after she described her own resuscitation, she said uh, that she was crawling down. Uh, it looked like a, a sort of a tunnel lined with lights and that a woman came to her named Elizabeth. And this woman said to her, I'm here to help you and lifted her up and took her uh, into this light and through this light. She, uh, but her Mormon faith, when I asked her mother, I said, so tell me what, you know, what did you teach her about heaven, etc." There's no tunnel to heaven. Uh, there's no, uh, there's nobody named Elizabeth in their family. Uh, there's no Saint Elizabeth. There's no uh, previous relative who's died named Elizabeth. Nobody has any idea where this uh, woman Elizabeth came from. And 
the uh, the family said uh, that they had taught her that when you die, it's like t- taking off a glove. So, you know, sort of the body being the glove, but the hand uh, in there. Uh, and, you know, and yet there there is none of that. There's, so none of the imagery that she was raised with was, uh, there was no, uh, you know, uh, particularly, uh, you know, the Jesus was not uh, particularly Mormon or anything like that. Furthermore, uh, she looked down from uh, where she thought was heaven, and uh, she saw uh, that her uh, brother seemed to have uh, some uh, sort of uh, uh, a problem with his heart. And uh, she felt uh, that uh, she had, one of the reasons she had to return was to help her mother with this. And uh, in fact, uh, that uh, had been previously uh, not known and yet uh, came to be true. So she seemed to have uh, insight into, uh, you know, information that she shouldn't have. If for a uh, religious experience, there is very re- uh, little uh, religious about it. <laughs> she, and, you know, and in her family, they, you know, they don't speak of a choice to return to earth or anything like that. Uh, if she had told me sort of the, your traditional, oh, yes, I went, you know, I was taken by angels up to heaven and described the normal Mormon heaven. Uh, I don't think we would be having this conversation, but I was very struck by uh, how uh, her experience, in fact, did not track her uh, upbringing uh, really at all, other than, you know, the heaven, God, you know, those sort of generic terms. Uh, yeah, I, I trained at Johns Hopkins and was pretty on track to be a uh, pediatric uh, neurologist. I was raised in the Jewish faith. Uh, in my uh, upbringing, uh, really, uh, you're, you know, you, you, as you know, uh, you can be Jewish and not believe in God. And, you know, we, we, had, we were sort of you know, very culturally Jewish. Uh, certainly, I went to synagogue when I was a kid. Uh, my parents didn't particularly believe in God. Uh, certainly, uh, they uh, never believed in a heaven or uh, anything remotely like that. And I really just, it just didn't think about these kinds of things. I was fascinated by how the brain works. And certainly, I thought that the brain creates consciousness. Uh, you know, the idea that consciousness works through the brain uh, it never even occurred to me. I had assumed, you know, being a critical care physician, I had assumed that uh, her experience was something that she sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, imagined after the fact. You know, you, you've come through a terrible experience and um, you're trying to struggling to make sense of it. And uh, the mind does not like memory gaps. Uh, the mind does not like, uh, you know, the mind wants to explain things, uh, even if they're not true. Uh, we're storytellers. And uh, our, we're designed to sit still, tell stories to explain uh, the events in our lives. Uh, and uh, I just assumed it was all that. Furthermore, there are several um, uh, agents that are commonly used uh, in resuscitation, which can cause what's called dissociation, uh, you know, meaning that sense of separation from your physical body. And so I thought it was probably uh, the drugs uh, that she was given. Uh, perhaps as lack of oxygen to the brain. But none of what we heard clinically supported any of this. For example, uh, she was uh, ultimately uh, resuscitated and sent to Primary Children's Hospital uh, in Utah. And (laughs) the nurses there report that as soon as she woke up, she immediately started asking for her heavenly playmates. You know, where's Andy? Where's Mark? You know, that doesn't really fit with a mind that's struggling to understand something and then comes up with a, you know, completely formed um, uh, explanation. So um, the reason I guess I'm going into this a little bit more because you're thinking the way we thought. And so we went ahead and designed a research uh, project uh, to attempt to, you know, answer the questions uh, that you're alluding to. But so, or I shouldn't say but, but and, I want to uh, perseverate a bit on this issue because I always hear people glibly saying, well, science says that near-death experiences can't be real or that science, you know, you know, uh, science says this, science says that. It turns out that science, to be sure, cannot explain near-death experiences. But that does not mean that 
that it debunks them. So what does it mean to confabulate? So that, that's what we're talking about. So, so if the mind is struggling with a memory gap, such as being unconscious uh, during a time you've been critically ill, uh, then, uh, you know, one very reasonable explanation, one that I see on Facebook almost every single day by people trying to understand their own near-death experience, is they say, well, maybe this is some sort of dream. Maybe this is a hallucination. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe this is some way the mind is trying to uh, uh, explain what happened. So what does that look like? Well, we know what it looks like because human beings uh, do this all the time. So, for example, if you ask an alcoholic who cannot possibly remember what they had for breakfast, if you ask them, what did you have for breakfast? They'll tell you in great detail. They'll tell you an elaborate, highly detailed uh, story, which is not true. But what they don't say is, I don't know. <laughs> what they don't say is, hmm, I kind of I remember this little fragment and that little fragment. No, the mind creates a seamless story if it's an invented story. So we went back to Seattle Children's Hospital where I was based and we systematically uh, interviewed all survivors of cardiac arrest over a 15 year period. Adults too, not just children. Yes, children. And we didn't accept volunteers to our study uh, we didn't put an advertisement saying, uh, by the way, did you have a near-death experience? Come tell us about it. Uh, instead, uh, we um, you know, went to the Human Subject Review Board and we told them what we wanted to do. And we titled our study, A Study of the Psychological Effects of Surviving an Intensive Care Unit. So as to not tip our hand as to what we were interested in. And we studied all types of children that survive uh, near, you know, ones that had a lack of oxygen to their brain, one treated with all different kinds of medicines, uh, children who survive cardiac arrests, uh, everything. So, and, and we did it in what's called a prospective manner, meaning that we, you know, instead of going back in time and, you know, it, which can be very, uh, you know, if you're going to, for example, my brother-in-law, Raymond Moody, um, we've gotten to know each other uh, since uh, studying near-death experiences, and I ended up marrying his sister-in-law. Oh, no way. I love that. I didn't I didn't know that. That's a bit of really nice personal family trivia. It was great. I, well, Raymond was is a big influence on my life, as he was uh, everybody who does this research. But, you know, he had to study adults who would come up to him after lectures and things like that. Well, that's going to then shape your, um, you know, your, your data that, you know, only a certain kind of person is going to want to go up to a researcher after a lecture and tell them of their experience. Or commonly, uh, you hear of an experience that somebody had, and then you, th you know, you've had something similar, so you'll want to talk about it. But that's not going to capture everybody who's had these experiences. And it's not going to give us a sense of, um, you know, are, are these experiences real or not? Or are they related to cardiac arrest? Or are they, you know, people that, you know, be on television? You know, at that time, uh, you could be on the Oprah Winfrey show for uh, talking about your near-death experience, etc. So we went ahead and we interviewed all survivors of cardiac arrest at Seattle Children's Hospital. And now there's a long answer to the question of introducing myself. Why am I on your show? Our study was astonishing. And I just feel a, a, a great responsibility to bring these results uh, to the public. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, particularly for grieving parents, that uh, our study and a subsequent study from a, a, uh, an adult cardiologist named Penn Von Lummel which you know, basically uh, used our same research um, design, we showed that these experiences are real and that they will happen to us all when we die. I don't get the sense that that is widely understood or known. I still see people that say, oh, these experiences must be neurochemicals in the brain or these experiences you know, must be this or must be that. We looked for all of that. Uh, we studied uh, children 
in every type of situation. And only those who survived cardiac arrest or otherwise came to the brink of death. It was only those who we could in advance say that child is unlikely to live. And sure enough, those children then, if they were resuscitated, were able to describe to us their experience. What percent, actually it's a two-part question, um, what percent of children who suffered cardiac arrest ended up having NDEs? And part two, is that equivalent to the percent of adults? Okay. So uh, our study uh, showed uh, we, we, you know, very few children, you know, fortunately, come to cardiac arrest and even fewer survive. Uh, so in a 15-year period, we were only able to identify 26 children who came to the point of death. And 24 of them described some sort of near-death experience. Now, that number is much lower in adults. Uh, it's not known why, uh, you know, it's not, uh, but uh, uh, Penn von Lummel's study showed probably perhaps 17 to 20% of adults uh, described near-death experiences. I, I think that the day, well, particularly a study like ours will never be done again. Um, it, it just won't be. Uh, and I think that the adult study, you know, these studies, they take a long time. They're difficult to, to do. You know, I, I think that, uh, you know, we simply don't know, uh, you know, whether this is some sort of artifact of uh, that we only had 26 patients, whereas uh, Dr. Von Lummel had hundreds of patients, or is there something different about, you know, are children so innocent that all of them are given this preview of heaven? Uh, you know, I think those are uh, kind of unknown questions. But not only did our children have these experiences, but they were all different, and yet they were the same. They were all different in the sense that, well, we talked about this religious child, you know, who said she went to heaven. Well, we had another, uh, this, uh, we had another young girl. She, uh, uh, I, I'm not laughing at her medical situation. I'm laughing because I know what she's going to say, and you don't yet. <laughs> I, I can't help it. It's, it's so, it's so hilarious. So she nearly died of a diabetic coma, and uh, was fortunately uh, we were able to resuscitate her. And uh, about a week afterwards, she said to me, uh, you know, when we enrolled her in our study, you know, etc. She said that uh, doctors came to her bedside and uh, asked her if uh, she wanted to go with them. And I said, huh, you know, well, so what do you mean doctors? How did you know they were doctors? And she said, well, they were 14 feet tall. They were wearing white and they had light bulbs in their bodies. <laughs> so, you know, I think a more religious child might have said those were angels. <laughs> That's why now you see why I was laughing. And, you know, I'll send you, I'll send you the picture, her picture of these uh, doctors. And, and her experience had nothing to do with heaven. It's very mechanistic. She, she said, they uh, told me uh, that I was to uh, press a button on a box. And if I pressed the green button, I could go with them. If I pressed uh, the red button, I would stay with my family. <laughs> and... <laughs> So that's why I mean by these experiences being odd. You know, you might say on the surface of it, well, this had nothing to do with uh, the first girl's experience. And yet it does, because it is a sense that she was conscious and aware and awake at the point of death. And, you know, so the specifics of her experience are a little bit different. But the main point that when we die and go into that deep state of unconsciousness, it's when we get to that point of death that paradoxically consciousness returns. It's almost in a greater expanded way. It's almost like when the brain dies and gets out of the way, now all of a sudden people can think and see and hear things that they've never experienced before. One girl said that to me. She said when she was in the place that, you know, she thought was heaven, a religious child, she said, I saw colors and rainbows that I didn't, you know, never knew existed. I, I'd never seen those kinds of colors before. And sure enough, it's not as if what she's saying is unreasonable. 
we know that there are <laughs> thousands, tens of thousands, millions of colors that, that we don't see. You know, we only see such a very narrow segment uh, of all the colors that there are to see. So uh, I'll give you a, a, another sense of, you know, I, I, I told you that I, I said that they were funny. Um, another boy, we resuscitated him. He was uh, to be admitted uh, at Seattle Children's Hospital uh, because he had a pacemaker in his heart. It, it abruptly failed while he was in uh, admissions. Uh, we resuscitated him on the lobby floor of Seattle Children's Hospital. After he was resuscitated, he opens his eyes and he looks at me and he goes, that was weird. You guys just sucked me back into my body. Unless you have seen that for yourself, you know, it's one thing to hear or to read about that, that I saw it or, you know, to read that somebody else said that they saw it or either you know, this out or the other. I feel incredibly privileged that I was able to resuscitate these children and that I was able to see this sort of thing myself. I mean, he opened his eyes and looked right at me and said, that was weird. You just sucked me back into my body. Now, you know, that's not a dream. That's not a hallucination. That's not a, you know, that's someone who is telling you exactly what happened to him only seconds ago. Uh, I'll give you another example. This is a young girl. Um, I was also a practicing pediatrician at the same time I worked uh, for uh, Airlift Northwest. Uh, which is uh, the air transport service. This uh, girl uh, developed heart failure from infectious mononucleosis. And we had to put a needle in her heart to restart. It. So that is near death. And just like the others, in the sense that she didn't remember anything about being in the hospital, which we expect traumatized patients usually don't. But then she says, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I do have one memory. It was when you brought that crash cart thing into my room. And, and, and I, I heard people uh, talking. And um, she said, then she describes leaving her physical body. And she says, and my grandmother was there who had previously passed. And I said, yes. And she said, I was just so shocked to see her <laughs> because she had previously died. She's like, you know, what, Grandma, what are you doing here? <laughs> and, she, and she said, well, Grandma's just, she was sort of surrounded in light and she was just sitting there on a chair. And, and then uh, this little girl says to me, and then I was back. And I said, well, what, what do you mean by that? And she said, that's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> so, so this is why I took the time to explain confabulation to you. Because this is clearly not somebody who is telling us a dream or a hallucination or a confabulation or some well-meaning effort to understand what happened to her. She's describing just little fragments of a powerful experience that she doesn't understand. And she herself is struggling to understand. She's going, that's what I'm trying to figure out. And then uh, your book, she reminds me a lot of your book. Because uh, later on, uh, when we interviewed her again, uh, she told us that she wasn't afraid to die anymore. Because I know a little bit more about it now. <laughs> that's what she told us. <laughs> you know, actually, it was kind of fun. That's what she said to us. You know, to hear these experiences from children and to hear them. And, and when they tell them the first time, you know, after they've told them the first or second time, then they lose that awe and that wonder. And you just, you know, that's why I mean that I just feel so privileged that I was able to hear these experiences. And that's why I want to share them with people. I, I just, you know, at this it's, it's enormously uh, comforting. And to hear him for the first time, we had uh, another uh, one of our patients. He was underwater for 45 minutes. And uh, his uh, parents were ski instructors. And he was, uh, they were coming home from a ski. You know, they had been uh, teaching skiing during the day. Uh, there was a heavy snowstorm as they were coming down the mountain. 
uh, in the Cascades up in Seattle, and they hit a bridge, in, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the railing, and they flipped over into the water below. And uh, they were uh, so they were there well under for 45 minutes. In the the world of in pediatric intensive care, uh, we know that you're not dead, and you know until you're warm and dead. You know, cold and dead doesn't do it. So, uh, you know, he was uh, eventually resuscitated. And uh, he says to me, you know, I, part of our study, we enrolled him in our study, of course, uh, surviving cardiac arrest. Uh, he told us uh, of his experience. And he said he was in a huge noodle. That's, that's the first time he described the experience. He said, uh, oh, you know, then suddenly I was in the huge noodle. And he traveled in this noodle, he said, into a place that he thought was heaven. And then he looks at me kind of puzzled and he goes, no, it, it couldn't have been a noodle because noodles don't have rainbows in them. You know, years later, now he just says that he was in the tunnel. You know, it's only that first time when he's, oh, yeah, I was in the middle, you know. But, you know, he doesn't use that terminology anymore. You know, I just feel, you know, again, you know, to hear him, you know, that, that, that's how you know, though, the authenticity of the experience. You know, as opposed to someone else, you know, who, I think from a common sense point of view, you know, we think, oh, these people hear all these experiences on TV. And so then they think the same thing happened to them. You know, I think that's a very common way that, you know, people think of, uh, you know, an alternative explanation for the near-death experience. Rather than thinking that they're real, you know, they're just some sort of well-meaning invention of the mind. But those of us who've actually been able to do those initial interviews, it's not what we hear. Uh, we hear... Uh, something which may later morph into your ordinary, you know, a near-death experience as the teller is trying to find language that we would understand. That's to be sure. Chris now describes his experience as being in the tunnel. But I still will never forget when the first time he said he was in the big noodle. <laughs> uh, now, I remember I told you that 24 out of 26 of our patients uh, had this experience or, you know, some type of, you know, I mean, you can see each one is different and typically each one's described differently. I want to tell you about one patient uh, who uh, we scored as not having a near-death experience. Uh, we interviewed her and this young girl, uh, she nearly drowned uh, a, in a, a fishing accident uh, off of Lake Washington. She uh, flipped out of the boat and sunk into about 20 feet of water. And she did not remember anything about the experience. So you think, you know. However, after I finished interviewing her, I noticed that her dad just seemed really kind of agitated or uncomfortable. And finally, you know, just as we were about to leave, you know, I just couldn't help myself. And I said, well, there's more to this story, isn't there? I mean, you know, there's something you're not telling me. And he said, yes. He said uh, he and his friend, uh, you know, a fishing buddy of his, were with his daughter. And uh, she, you know, tragically, you know, the way, you know, a child's standing up and dancing in a small boat and then flipped over the side. They, of course, were panicked. And they uh, desperately free dove to try to uh, find her body. And Lake Washington is very overcast, uh, and uh, the, it was just all darkness as they uh, dove. Until they dove, you know, what, you know, they're going to give it one more try. And he told me that suddenly there was a light at the bottom of the lake. And he followed this light, and the light seemed to be glowing from her body. And that it was that light that uh, led them, you know, to uh, be able to uh, uh, save her and resuscitate. We, we think that these experience, well, either, I mean, I think these experiences are not just think, I think the science tells us that these experiences are real. But I, I'm thinking about to myself back before I studied these experiences. And I assume that these people are uh, religious, or they, you know, they, they want to desperately want to believe something, or, uh, you know, 
you know, we're all afraid to die. We're all afraid of what's going to happen. You know, a lot of people uh, have a religious, uh, a religious point of view that they want to impose on others. You know, so I think that we often think that these experiences come out of that feeling. That's not what you see when you actually interview. This, this gentleman was incredibly skeptical of his own experience. He hardly could believe that this really happened. And he was deeply conflicted about even mentioning it to me. He and his friend the next day rented scuba gear and they went down and they sat at the bottom of Lake Washington because they themselves became convinced that maybe this was just some weird light, you know, stray, uh, you know, uh, a light that came in. You know, they themselves went through every possible explanation that they could think of to explain this away. So my experience is that far from people inventing this stuff to try to, uh, you know, reassure themselves spiritually or, you know, convert us to their spirituality, I find that by and large, people try to explain this stuff away, that uh, they, they think that they're crazy for having had the experience. Uh, I asked to interview his friend. His friend uh, would not talk about it. He, he verified that it happened. And then he looked at me and he said, you know, it's too freaky. He said, I'm just not, you know, I, 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 this is all I have to say. I, you know, I'm not going to deny that it happened, but I don't want to say anything more about it. And that's really, I, I think that nowadays, you know, I think that we have more skepticism of spirituality, too much skepticism. And uh, these experiences, I think, will help us to start to validate our own spiritual experiences and, and teach us that maybe our experiences are real, as opposed to us debunking their experiences as not real. <laughs> uh, I'll give you a quick example of what I mean by this. Remember, I told you about Chris Eggleston. Um, he's the young boy that uh, his car flipped over the uh, railing and the uh, plunged into a river below. It, it took well over 45 minutes uh, to get rescue crews to him. It's kind of a, an amazing story of how they were rescued at all. Uh, it was a heavy driving snow and a car was behind them that was following them just because it could see their taillights. So that, you know, that was the way the car behind them uh, was staying on the road. Uh, once they flipped over the side of the guardrail, from the guy behind's point of view, they suddenly disappeared. And rather than, you know, when I put myself in this place, I think I probably would have just kept driving on, but he became curious. And he thought, well, why did their taillights just disappear? So he pulled over and he looked over the guardrail and saw them, you know, 40 feet below uh, in the water. So the uh, family, uh, uh, one brother, uh, unfortunately, uh, died. Chris was in the back seat. Uh, he was eventually resuscitated. Uh, the mother was able to free herself on her own, and she was able to kick out the windshield of the car and swim uh, to the surface. When, when she was by the side of the uh, river, she uh, thought that her husband was sitting there next to her. And, you know, and, and these experiences are vividly real, by the way. They're not like what you see on TV, some weird little ghostly image, or etc. You know, she describes her husband as real as this experience we're having now. And she looked over at him and she said, well, you know, why aren't you down there trying to rescue our children? And he looked at her and he said, everything is all right. Everything is as it's supposed to be. And she started screaming at him, you know, how could, you know, what are you, you know, are you crazy? You know, our, our, our children, uh, you know, the, everything is not all right. And then he disappeared. When she heard her son's near-death experience, her son, after telling me uh, of his, you know, going to what he thought was heaven, and he then said to me very dramatically, but was it real? 
because if it was real, you have to tell all the old people. And <laughs> so, but she heard that and then she said to me, yes, because if his experience was real, then my experience was real because her husband in fact died in that car. Her husband did not make it out of the car. And, and yet she had the perception that he was sitting next to her as real as we are talking now. And that he gave her those final words of reassurance. And so uh, for her, her son's near death experience validated this very powerful after death visitation that she had. And I have sort of come I've come full circle, or not, maybe it's not, that's the wrong word for it, but I have completely reversed my beliefs. <laughs> I, when I started uh, studying near-death experiences, I really never thought about spirituality. Uh, we thought, frankly, we thought our study would just be sort of a one-off, you know, to just show Elizabeth Kubler-Ross that we were smarter than her and that drugs really cause these experiences after all. <laughs> and, 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 you know, now I've come to understand that these experiences validate a whole range of spiritual experiences that right now we dismiss as, you know, as hallucinations, uh, you know, premonitions of death, shared dying experiences, after death visitations, because I agree with that mom, that if the near death experience is real, which it is, then all the rest of these experiences, I, there's no reason that they're not all real. I want to ask, I know there's a lot of consistency, especially I really only until speaking with you have known mainly about adults having NDEs and there's a consistency in terms of how they start living their lives differently. Unfortunately, many of them end up divorced. They transform and their values change. Now, children haven't really formed yet in terms of who they're going to be. Did their personalities follow the consistency of how adults tend to transform into more loving, less materialistic? Did, are these children then that kind of person and continue on that way? Yeah. Right. By studying adults that had near-death experiences, we can learn the great secret of life. And guess what it is? It's to be nice. <laughs> it is. They grow up to be really. They grow up to be really nice. We did a study of adults who had near-death experiences as children, and uh, you know, again, we did a very, uh, you know, we we subjected our adults to all sorts of you know multi multi uh, personality inventories and death anxiety scales, and we looked at their tax returns and we interviewed their spouses, and you know, and. Um, and then we carefully compared them to controls. Our, we looked at ordinary controls, people had never had any kind of spiritual experience. But we also looked very carefully at people who nearly died but did not have a near-death experience. Because maybe this transformation comes from just being close to death. You know, maybe when you nearly die, you're like, oh, my God, you know, now I appreciate how wonderful life is. Uh, the research shows that that feeling usually lasts maybe six months or a year. <laughs> that it wears off pretty quick, quickly. Whereas having a near-death experience, I mean, where you actually, you know, are unconscious, comatose at the point of death and have this experience, it creates a transformation for life. Our study subjects gave more money to charity they were more likely to be in helping professions. Uh, they were more likely to spend time alone in meditation. Uh, they feel that family uh, is more important than our control groups do. Uh, they have very little death anxiety. Uh, these are, they're truly transformed. And they're transformed in a way that I think you could just sum up as they're just really nice people. That they believe that it's so important to be loving and to not judge their fellow men. And they live that way, uh, you know, as opposed to the rest of us. That, you know, we try to live up to this stuff. Um, and we sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. Uh, but, you know, if you're fortunate enough to come to the point of death and survive, that uh, gives you sort of a post-traumatic bliss syndrome and uh, profoundly alters the way uh, you uh, live life. I'll give you an example of what I mean by this. 
because um, th this anecdote, I think, uh, it will uh, put the put to rest many of the. Um, you know, when I hear this kind of thing, I'm like, oh, my God, are they like a bunch of moonies? Are they become cultists or, you know, are they, you know, what am I actually are I talking about? So uh, one of our study subjects, uh, he told me that uh, his experience was, uh, you know, he, he nearly died, went to a place he thought was heaven, was told, go back, Bobby, you have a job to do. So this was back when I was first doing this kind of research and I was, you know, a little bit more cynical and I get out inwardly. I'm just like going, Oh, great. You know, what's his job, you know, cure cancer or, you know, convert the masses or whatever. So I was like, okay, alrighty. So what's your job? I mean, what's the big job that, 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 you know, that God sent you back to do. And he looks at me and he goes, what, what, what? I already told you what my job was. Uh, I run a small construction company. <laughs> But I said, that, that's what, that's what, he said, yeah. He said, he said, I hire all my high school friends. He said, those numb nuts, they, they'd never be able to get a job if it weren't for me. He said, and yet we have a really, you know, really successful little company. They do small remodels and stuff like that. And he doesn't have any particular spirituality, doesn't particularly, uh, uh, you know, he definitely believes in life after death doesn't really have an opinion about what the voice was, the voice that said, go back, Bobby, you have a job to do. But one thing he's certain of is that he was sent on this earth to run a small construction company and hire his high school friends. Uh, it's enormously reassuring. You know, clearly the lesson from near-death experiences is that we're here to learn lessons of love. So we have specific tasks that we're here to learn. And, uh, you know, that when we all die, I mean, Nazi prison guards, as I'm sure you know from, you know, studying adult near-death experience, Nazi prison guards had near-death experiences. You know, we're all going to get a big attaboy from God. We're going to get a big hug from God when we die, uh, regardless of whether we failed all our tests of love or not, <laughs> apparently. And so what were Nazi prison guards and DEs like they had the experience of being forgiven by their victims that's uh, reported in a book called the gifts of the near-death experience and they uh, that's what they report but i'll tell you what uh, raymond when raymond's asked a question of what is his favorite near-death experience he'll often answer by saying oh saddam hussein's and the reason he does that he didn't have one did he no Yes, Saddam Hussein describes uh, several uh, near-death experiences uh, in uh, his writings. And Raymond does this for a very provocative reason, because he deliberately takes somebody that we think of as evil, you know, somebody that we think is a bad person. And yet it's clear that they also have near-death experiences. They also have this experience of non-judgmental love and doesn't seem right to the brain of, uh, affected with trauma. They become unconscious. They have seizures. They have loss of, you know, muscle tone, uh, bowel movements, uh, you know, etc. But when they're at the point of actually dying, when they have to shut the experiment down, they suddenly regain consciousness and they have the perception that they're leaving their physical body. They have the perception of being embraced by a loving light and they're certainly transformed by it. One of my close friends uh, went through the program and he immediately quit the Navy and became a family therapist. <laughs> so that's, that's a transformation. He had a 20-year career as a fighter pilot, which is a very highly prestigious career uh, that they spend, you know, their entire life training for. Went in the centrifuge, had a near-death and out-of-body experience as a result, and um, promptly uh, resigned his commission, and he's now a family therapist in California. So, you know, that's a dramatic example of the transformation. So, you know, I finished, I wanted to make that point because... 
to say why the child has the experience and whether the adult has the experience, I think, you know, my own personal view is that everyone has this experience and adults are more likely to forget it or to block it out or to see it as being outside of what they can believe in or not having a, a, the like I like the way you you phrased it you know that their neurons have become become their their neurons are no longer capable of having this kind of experience sure why not i mean we we can't experience anything unless our neurons are capable of uh, creating it just to remind your listeners uh, we don't actually perceive this reality uh, we're not, you're not actually uh, hearing me right now. Uh, you're not actually seeing me. What is happening is electronic impulses uh, are being picked up by your body's biosensors. They translate those electronic impulses uh, into electrochemical signals that then go to your brain. And then your brain creates your model of reality. So your your, your body creates what it thinks it's seeing. And, and this is just, this is neuroscience uh, 101. And it's been shown again and again and again that people frequently will not see things that they're not expecting to see. Uh, one of the most uh, ex impressive experiments is, uh, was done, I think about 20 years ago, uh, in which they had students uh, pass a basketball and uh, bounce a basketball and pass a basketball and be focused on that task. And then they have a guy dress up in a gorilla suit and he carefully threads his way through the students bouncing a basketball. And afterwards, few of them actually saw him. People watching the video of it, about 50% of them will not see what is right there before their eyes because they're, they're not expecting to see it. Their brain's mental model doesn't contain man in gorilla suit walking, <laughs> you know, walking past people uh, bouncing a basketball. So if, if we can't see the things in those situations, it doesn't surprise me that other people say, well, well, I didn't see that angel, even though perhaps, you know, you saw it. And it doesn't surprise me that people don't perceive or uh, recognize their near-death experience. Or, uh, now, there's a second part to this. I like your point of view that, that their neurons just aren't ready to see it because that fits with the way the human brain works. We have an internal model of the world, and then as we, let's say, walk through life, as we walk down a street, what we're doing is we're constantly mapping what we see and matching it with our internal model. The way I put it like that, actually, if you think about it, it makes common sense. The guy that uh, does a lot of this work, uh, he did a, there's a great PBS series. It's called The Brain. And so people that really want to you know, do a deeper dive into this, uh, PBS, it's a great series uh, on the brain. And the researcher there has people put on real life goggles, real time goggles. So if we were really seeing this world, you could see what it was like and it's nauseating. It just makes, you know, because everything's constantly shifting and constantly moving. And, you know, and I mean, we, we, we couldn't possibly uh, function if we were constantly tracking this reality. Uh, the, the, you know, just, just that alone, it, it's uh, viscerally overwhelming. I think another part of it though is that we have become sort of trained to think that the near-death experience is this going through a tunnel, out of the body, into the light. Well, I met a woman uh, when I was doing a book signing, and she told me she was so sad that she uh, didn't have a near-death experience. Uh, she had nearly died in a car accident. And she said, you know, I was just so hoping to see my dad you know, because people are always talking about how, you know, their relatives come to them. And I said, that's, you know, you know, I'm really sorry, you know, but tell me, what do you remember? And she said, you know, I don't really remember anything about, I just, it was all dark. I felt warm. And I know I was thinking of my dad because my, I just felt my dad hugging me. 
and my dad was just all around me and he was just hugging me. But she didn't see that as a near death experience. And yet, and yet certainly it was, you know, and, and that's why I think the children's experiences are, are useful to remember because each one of their experiences is so different. It's not true that we all have this very stereotyped experience. What's true is that we're conscious and awake and aware when we die. And as I pointed out to her, I said, you know, that you had any memory of the time that you were in a car wreck that defies modern neurology. Modern neurology is that when you have major trauma like that, you should lose six, 12 hours of short-term memory. You shouldn't remember anything. And yet you're telling me that you have this very one clear cut, very vivid memory of your dad hugging you, of being surrounded by your dad's love. You know, what could be more beautiful than that? And something must have triggered something in her because then she started sobbing. And then she suddenly, oh, it did happen to me. You know, so I, I think that those are the two factors that work for uh, adults is, you know, one, the sheer uh, uh, neurophysiology of that we have a hard time perceiving things that are not already in our mental model. And the second thing is that we often dismiss them. Uh, we don't recognize them for what they truly are. I have a couple of questions, actually. So first of all, so yes, the near-death experiences are different for different people. And so what I often wondered in the beginning and what I, a lot of people wonder is if they're genuine, why are they so different? If this is factually what happens after you die, shouldn't it be the same for everybody? Okay. So why do we have any shared experiences? Let's start with that first. Um, you know, like I told you, um, you know, we are really just sensory, you know, we, we live in this giant sea of electromagnetic uh, impulses and we sample that and then we create this uh, mental image uh, that we think is reality. So we spend hours and hours and hours teaching ourselves, like what is the color red? We, we spend hours, that's red, that's red, that's red, that's red, that's red. It takes, I mean, it really, it takes hundreds of hours to teach a child their colors. Well, what we're doing by that is we're finding a common language. You know, we're essentially saying, oh, the electromagnetic wavelength of light that is reflected from, you know, that, the, that stuffed animal that you're looking at, we call that red. We don't really care what it looks like to you. We want to all have the same. And, and we know that it does look different for many different people. And we know that different cultures even separate the colors differently. Some cultures, uh, brown green is, becomes its own color. Uh, you know, whereas we don't differentiate colors like that. We know that there's many, um, um, you know, primarily, uh, you know, native populations that don't see the world the way we do from behind the eyes. See, we sort of have this idea that we're sort of in our head and like a little person is looking out uh, through our eyes. Cultures that live uh, in uh, jungles and live uh, in difficult to navigate environments, they already frequently start with themselves as being situated out of their body. And they already have a sense uh, of uh, direction. And so uh, oftentimes, you know, we say, how are you? How are you doing? These cultures will say, what direction are you? Uh, where are you pointed? Uh, are you uh, eastward or, or, or westward? Are you? And there's an excellent, there's an excellent uh, series on this, uh, again, on PBS. I learned so much about uh, the brain from PBS, um, linguists who've gone to study these uh, cultures. So the reality that we have now, we spend a lot of time finding common words to describe it. But even that does seem to break down. If I say the word box, uh, you know, that means something very different to you than it does to me. And yet we still have a rough idea of what is box. If I think, uh, if I say I saw a box 
and I'm really thinking of a gigantic box uh, that I can put a piece of furniture in, and you're thinking of a teeny tiny box, I don't indignantly say to you, well, you're just making that up. Well, what's wrong with me? And you could even think of the sport boxing, you know, which is then you get, I mean, that just shows where two people, the extent of difference of perception. Exactly. And, and I don't spend a lot of time uh, or I really any time, you know, uh, saying, well, you know, you, you out of bad will or, or just inventing uh, this or, or how can there be a box if everybody has their own different perception of box? And the, when you uh, talk to people uh, such as um, who are uh, autistic, high functioning autistics, they tell you the same thing. They'll say, you know, I'm overwhelmed if you say the word dog to me because it means nothing. When I hear dog, there's like, you know, 50 different images immediately come to my mind that I think of each tiny little different dog. You know, so that's called being a concrete thinker. Whereas, you know, we're uh, more abstract thinkers. Well, when we come to spiritual issues, we haven't spent any time finding a common language or finding a, a, a common a thing that we can all understand. And we're in a very splintered society. So, you know, we have, uh, we already start with all sorts of preconceptions. We have Muslims, we have Christians, we have Zoroastrians, we have, you know, Jews. We, you know, so everybody has already come to the table with a very fixed idea of what we're supposed to perceive as a spiritual experience. Well, that would be like if I was, you know, going back to our box analogy, if I was trying to uh, share with you boxes and you already came in with your preconceived idea, no, 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 boxes can only be red. No, 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 boxes can only, you know, uh, you know, be uh, uh, oblong or rectangular. They can't be square or, you know, it just, I mean, that's what we're faced with. And I, I think that that's, that's what it is in a nutshell, is that uh, these are people who are struggling to use words which really were never intended to be used uh, for a, a spiritual experience. And yet we're trying to use those words to share with each other what happened to us. And that's why I love talking to children, because the common, mostly children just say, I don't know. And yet they have this look in their eye, you know, I don't know. That's what I'm trying to figure out. I, you know, wow, that was weird. Wow. Wow. You know, and, and maybe if we just left it at that, because I think in the well-meaning efforts to explain things, then something can get lost. Uh, I, I'll give you an example of, of, of this um, that I think illustrates the, the, the complexities I interviewed a young boy uh, who dug a giant pit on the beach. I did the same thing when I was a kid. Uh, and he just dug and dug and dug and jumped in it, and the walls collapsed, uh, and he nearly died. He said uh, that he uh, then perceived himself as being out of his physical body, that he was put into an ambulance, that he sort of traveled along with the ambulance, but this sort of vantage point above his body, uh, you know, went to the hospital where he said he was met by a wizard and a wizard told him, struggle and you shall live. And this uh, boy, I think maybe 10 or 11, you know, uh, into uh, Dungeons and Dragons and video games and things like that. I happened to interview him, uh, oh, you know, months later. And he says to me, I you know, asked him about the experience again. He said, well, you know, I've learned that it wasn't a wizard. I've learned it was our Savior, Jesus Christ, that uh, he is who actually came to me. Um, it wasn't a wizard at all. Because that's what religious people started to tell him, I assume. That's what he was, you know, his adulting experience. But I think that adults, as adults, we're, we're trying to find common ground. Okay, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you do believe Jesus Christ is your Savior, um, well, that does seem to be what happened to me. That seems to be, you know, as, as the only way that they could explain it. But that doesn't mean it didn't, you know, that it didn't happen just because people can't uh, describe it uh, using terms which uh, make sense to us. And, and I agree. Uh, 
it's difficult to describe the near-death experience uh, in commonplace religious terms. Uh, it just, uh, I think, I think that's very true. I, I think that, uh, in you know, that's why so many adults have near-death experiences. They say, "Well, I no longer believe in religion." You know, I believe in spirit. I believe in God. I, you know, I believe that something happened. Well, it would make more sense to think that this experience, whatever it is, it comes to us and that, that we filter it through our own culture and our own way of understanding it. Uh, you know, far from that people are just inventing it. And that's why I, at the beginning of the talk, our, our discussion, I emphasize the, how these children, you know, that's what I'm trying to figure out. You know, they don't come out. They're not blopping out. Yes, I saw my sainted grandmother just as I thought I would. She was waiting for me on the other side. And, you know, they do not say that. They go, you know, holy, you know, wow, you know, WTF, you know, my grandmother was there. I mean, that, that's, that's what they do. And that's more consistent with a real experience that we simply don't have words for. So now I want to back up to the beginning. You said that you said something like 20, 30 years ago, there wasn't science to explain any of this. And then now there is. What What is the science we have now that could explain this? <sighs> well, quantum physics has been actually around for about 100 years. So when I say 20 or 30 years... Um, however, uh, it's really, uh, only been about, oh, uh, you know, I don't want, uh, I'll say the wrong date. So, um, but about 20 or 30 years ago, a series of science experiments came out that showed that this universe is truly entangled. And by entanglement, they mean that atoms and electrons you know, that are thousands and thousands of miles away from us are actually in some way that we can't understand. They're actually are part of us. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you these experiments because they're easy to explain and they're, and they, ex, they explain how startling it is. What they do is they take a source of light. They, they take a, a pure um, um, wavelength of light. And then they, they, they send it through a mirror that splits it into two parts. And so one part, I'm just making these, this up, well, you know, let's say one uh, part that comes out is red and then the other side uh, is green. But they all came from this common source. They then down the road, take one part, you know, it's split into two streams. They then change one stream back to red. You know, if it was green, they'll switch it back to red. Boom. The other stream switches too. Without any understanding of how this could be communicated, without any change of information, with, without, you know, with, without, without anything, that by influencing the one stream of light that came from this common source, you ended up influencing the other stream, even though you didn't uh, affect it in any way. Well, we all came from a common source. We all came from the Big Bang. You know, we, the, the, um, the subatomic particles that are in us right now were once all compressed together in what they call a singularity, meaning the entire universe was in some tiny little dot of mass. We all came from the same source. They've replicated the entanglement experiments, uh, you know, now to the two thousands of miles away. So it's not just some sort of uh, local phenomena. So when children that have near-death experiences tell us that we're all entangled and that everything is one, they're stating a scientific principle. Well, what about this idea about time? They one thing uh, that they uh, you know children said again and again and again to me is my experience could have lasted forever or it could have lasted a second. We have definitely been shown in the last 20 or 30 years that time is a function of our brains, that time is not independent, you know, that, that we use time like a biological clock. 
just to, you know, to keep track of how old we're getting and how we've progressed through life. But that outside of the, the creation of our mind, time does not exist. And the theoretical physicists now, not just, not just theoretically, but experimentally, have been able to run their experiments forwards and backwards. They've been able to predict the outcome of experiments before they even set the parameters of the experiment. They, I mean, as, as, as many physicists like to say, if you're not totally, um, if your mind isn't totally blown, you don't understand physics. <laughs> but I mean, so, so we're starting to understand that time doesn't exist. Space doesn't exist. That we all are entangled as one. Neuroscience, particularly the work of uh, David Eagleman, it just the most astonishing person is really showing us that this reality is, is, I don't want to say it's not real. It is real, but it's, 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 we talked before about how it's invented by our mind, but I want to give you an example of the kind of work that Eagleman does. He takes a blind patient and he takes a suit that goes around their skin and then he takes visual images, visual information, and translates it into the movement of little bumps on these suits. So that now the visual information is being translated into you know, little taps on the skin. And sure enough, you know, once he starts going with this, blind people start to see. And they don't just you know, they actually start to see. They don't just, you know, say, oh, I can translate the movement of those bumps. And I understand that that means that, you know, whatever image might be in front of them, they start to actually create a mental image. And yet none of that information came in through their eyes. Blind sense birth people. No, I don't believe that they're blind from birth. My understanding is that they're that they, that they already have the concept of what vision is, and that um, now just visual information is being routed by a different system, and yet their brain takes that information and then creates this reality from it. So apparently, the brain doesn't care how it gets the information that it's willing to use whatever information it gets to create reality. Well, that's now starting to really break down our idea that this is some sort of uh, uh, very uh, fixed reality, you know, you know, the idea that we're sort of a, like people who are inside uh, something that, you know, a very structured reality. And it makes us more like we're a video game of some sort. And, and those are the kinds of scientific advances that I'm talking about. That uh, you know, they're blurring our understanding uh, of reality and opening us up to the idea that sure, well, here's how I like to say it. People are always saying to me, well, the near-death experience is a hallucination. And well, the work of someone like David Eagleman and the other modern neuroscientists is saying this is all hallucination. <laughs> You know, so that's what I think people have to understand. Some of the great videos of all time now are when you get these Tibetan monks talking to modern neuroscientists like David Engelman. And it's like they're talking the same language now. You know, it's like ancient mysticism meets modern science because, you know, we're, we're, we're discovering that. It, it's not that the near-death experience we're learning the near-death experiences is real, but our objections to that, when we say, wait a minute, no, it's not real. What we're learning is that's because we don't understand reality. This is what's not real. <laughs> the the near-death, well, as a child told me, it wasn't just that it was real. It was realer than real. Yeah, that's what they all say, is the consistencies of near-death experiences. Well, but that's why the science is important, because the science not only is uh, the science on near death. I mean, everybody who's done clinical uh, studies of this uh, has come up with the same results. When I hear scientists say that, 
you know, well, it's usually people. People say to me, oh, science doesn't believe in the near-death experience. I'm like, what scientists are those? <laughs> and not any scientists I know, and I know most of them in the field. Um, but uh, it, it's just, it's really that we're learning that this reality is, and that fits, doesn't it? If we're here to learn lessons of love, I mean, why would we spend all this energy creating a reality, you know, unless it meant that we could interact with each other, unless it meant that we can, you know, have our challenges, uh, even to the challenges of being a Nazi prison guard and, uh, you know, and learn lessons from it. Uh, it's the near-death experience. It's real. And uh, this reality, according to modern science, is very plastic and clearly made up in our mind. And so I have a final question because it's almost been an hour and a half. Um, and this is fascinating. I could just keep you on for five hours. So of all the NDEs you've studied, what is the one that you think was the most shockingly veridical? Meaning for our listeners, that means verified, um, you know, like this happened and then it was verified in the quote unquote real world. <sighs> I can't say that any of them are shockingly uh, because it's so commonplace. Um, well, certainly, uh, I think one of the most astonishing ones uh, was a, a young girl who uh, had a similar. I remember I told you about uh, I told you about Crystal, who looked down and she saw her brother. And she draws a picture of her brother with a heart. There, there was a much more dramatic, uh, similar type of experience. A young girl was able to tell her mother after she was resuscitated that it was her unborn child who would have uh, heart problems. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, after she reported that to us and to uh, her mother, you know, a year later, then uh, her mother uh, became pregnant and had a child with severe uh, congenital heart disease. Uh, so that's one that I've seen for myself. If, uh, I mean, uh, you know, a young boy, um, he, I have to tell you the funny parts first. Um, he, he said uh, that he rose up out of his physical body, went to this other reality uh, where he could run and double jump with God. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, that's, so that's how unique ex each experience is. You know, I don't, and you know, it's easier to understand the points that we made earlier when we say something like run and double jump with God, because it doesn't have a religious element to it. You know, he's not saying I ran with Jesus and double jumped with Jesus. But nevertheless, when we're trying to assess, well, why did that person say Jesus? And this person said, you know, uh, you know, some other religious figure. Well, we're not asking, well, how come they all couldn't run and double jump with God? I mean, you know, each one has their own take on the experience. Um, anyway, uh, so he was very insistent uh, after he was resuscitated that he saw his grandmother hugging his mother in the waiting room. And sure enough, his grandfather uh, had unexpectedly come at a great distance uh, to be at his bedside. He would have no way of knowing that. He had no way of knowing that, you know, before he uh, was recessive, you know, uh, he, had a, he had a trach, so he was hospitalized anyway. And then his trach clogged off, and that's how he nearly died. Um, he had uh, no knowledge that his grandfather was coming, and uh, his parents didn't even know the grandfather was coming uh, until it actually happened. And yet when he woke up, he said, I saw mommy hugging grandmother. Uh, you know, so these things... I, I think they're very commonplace. I think people get hung up on them because, well, you could sort of explain away this one, you could explain away that one, and, you know, this, that, the other, you know, et cetera. Well, but you can't explain them all away. <laughs> I mean, you know, that if you're going to take that sort of ruthlessly nihilistic approach, I think you're at the point where, uh, you know, for example, I've never been to the Ukraine, but I believe it's real. But I guess, you know, if I was as, as, as skeptical, I, I don't believe these, I call them pseudo-skeptics. But if I was as skeptical as these people are, 
uh, you couldn't prove to me that Ukraine was real. I mean, really, if you brought me pictures of it, I could say they were doctored. Uh, if, you t t if you introduced me to people from the Ukraine, I could say they were making it up. I mean, I think that's, that's how you have to get if you want to dismiss near-death experiences as being real. You have to be that ruthlessly uh, narrow-minded and uh, discarding most of the evidence. Well, so thank you so much. It's been- Thank you. Pickles will be saying hi to everyone. Um, where can our listeners find you, follow you? My website is easy. It's melvinmorsemd.com. So M-E-L-V-I-N-M-O-R-S-E, just melvinmorsemd.com. My books are in the public library. You know, so uh, you, you can go to your library. Um, uh, I live in rural uh, South Carolina, and my library here carries my books. So I'm so happy. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I've got a website online, and uh, my book is uh, Closer to the Light. Then I wrote a book called Transformed by the Light, which is uh, about our study of adults who had near-death experiences as children. I wrote a book called Parting Visions which is about the whole range of premonitions of death, the after-death experiences. And then we finally put it all together into a scientific work called Where God Lives, in which we uh, sum up uh, the scientific research and the neuroscience of understanding how could this be? How can our brains actually connect to the universe? You know, rather than, rather than that being some sort of philosophical or spiritual concept, you know, how could that be a scientific concept? And so that's on a book called Where God Lives. I'm very proud of that book. It was published in the year 2005. We won an award from uh, the European Booksellers Awards, uh, Best Nonfiction Paperback uh, in 2007. And since then, no one in the scientific community has in any way uh, doubted what we wrote uh, you know, I've published uh, many peer-reviewed papers. The only person who's come along who said, no, 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 they were wrong, is a guy named uh, Mario Beauregard at the Montreal University. And that's because he showed that it's not a God spot. It's a God brain. So, so the, only, the only scientific, uh, neuroscientific work on spirituality since our work just said they were wrong. It's not a God spot. One third of the brain connects us with, with the spiritual universe. And, you know, even a, even a skeptic, a guy named Roger Nelson wrote a book called the spiritual doorway of the mind. He also doesn't dispute uh, that uh, our brains are hard, hardwire uh, for spirituality. He just doubts that the experience is real in the sense that you're really encountering God when you die. Science is never going to come to that. I mean, if 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 God appeared in the room to both of us right now, uh, you know, we could say, hey, "Sorry, I think you're a hallucination." I mean, and, and that would be, you know, that's that's going to be our choice. Um, so, you know, when we, but even Roger Nelson agrees that we're spiritually hardwired to have this experience. It just, you know, I mean, the idea that that sort of uh, our, uh, we've evolved brains, which let us see something like God when we die as some final farewell to life. Uh, seems kind of far-fetched to me, but a lot of people seem to believe it. Uh, and, you know, it, uh, well, I guess we're all going to find out because <laughs> we're all going to have this experience whether we believe in it or not. Right, right. And, you know, it seems we survive in some form, whether there's, a god or how whatever form but, but it definitely seems our consciousness interacts normally since, since the meaning of life is to be nice uh we probably should just spend our time being nice and not worry about whether this experience is real or not <laughs> we're going to have it when we die uh, we can figure out then if it's real or not to get more information on what the fuck just happened go to wtfjusthappened.net. There you can order my book, What the Fuck Just Happened? A Sciency Skeptic Explores Grief, Healing, and Evidence of an Afterlife. And you can learn all about how I came to conclude 
that there most likely is an afterlife. You can also learn about the early stages of my grief and the amazing, fascinating people I met along the way. You can also read about how much I harassed them, trying to get evidence, see if they were cheating, and see if they were sane. There, you can subscribe to our newsletter. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. It makes such a difference, especially for a new podcast like this one. And if any of you have had a crazy what the fuck yourself, have any questions, feedback, or just want to say hi, reach out on either Instagram at WTF underscore just underscore happened underscore or email me at hello at WTF just happened dot net. And remember, you don't have to draw any final conclusions as you wonder what the fuck just happened. <laughs>